Tokyo Hydro is one of the world's largest electrical utilities. Its new business ventures division is responsible for marketing all the types of products other than electricity, such as Hydro's expertise, its byproducts, and its technologies to the private sector. What does it take to run an entrepreneurial division, such as the New Business Ventures Division, in a large corporation like Ontario Hydro? We'll find out in a minute when we meet Don Anderson, who heads up the division. So stay tuned for careers. I'm Peter Wolfel and welcome to Careers. Don Anderson has been in charge of Ontario Hydro's New Business Ventures division since its establishment in January 1984. The division runs as a separate profit center and in 1988 it had sales of $56 million and a net profit of over $10 million. This money helps Ontario to keep its electricity rates down lower than they otherwise might be. Don, welcome to the show. Thank you, Peter. It's nice to be here. Don, you've done some moving around. You were born in Chatham, Ontario. Mm -hmm. you, then you studied engineering physics in Toronto. And then you went to England to study postgraduate studies. Now, why did you go to England? Well, I was lucky enough when I finished engineering school at Toronto to win a scholarship. So when somebody hands me some free money, I'm happy to take it. <laughs> and in fact, in the profession I was working in, the British universities were considered at that time to be the best in the world. So the combination was a winning combination for me. So what did you take there? I studied advanced engineering in, in England. Okay. And then you later studied advanced management in Banff. The Banff School of Advanced Management is an experience that uh, anyone that's interested in running a large corporation should never miss. It's not like the schools at Western or at uh, York or the business schools where you get your MBA. This is a, a lockup in the Rocky Mountains. And they bring in people from all the different businesses. I can remember studying with people in the lumber industry and banks. and electric utility and gas industry and having all those people study together concentrated manner Saturdays Sundays evenings for eight weeks is quite an experience and we studied everything from law to international finance to did you take that while you were already working for Ontario that's Hydro? correct I did okay and how long did it go for eight weeks Okay. then you joined Ontario Hydro in 1963 63. where you were closely associated with its nuclear program for the next 21 years. Can you tell us about that experience? Well, it's uh, hard to believe it's 21 years that I was in the nuclear business, but my postgraduate work in England uh, got me into nuclear physics and nuclear science. And when I came back to Canada with a new wife that I'd married in Europe, I had to find a job. And it turned out that my degree and the, company's need, and the country's needs fitted so I joined Ontario Hydro and worked at their earliest and first little nuclear power station in the Ottawa Valley. Mm. What's and that one called? NPD. All right. That was quite an experience for a European wife. We lived in a log cabin 20 miles from any town. And after her being born and raised, <laughs> lived and raised in Europe to be transferred to there, it was quite an experience for her. But I, in the time I worked in the nuclear industry, I was first, uh, by the time I was 30, I was a sh what was known as a shift supervisor. On, the, on a nuclear power station, and that's like being a, an airline captain on a 747 flying over the Atlantic. It's a heck of a lot of responsibility, but it sure teaches you quick how to learn to work with people. And from there, I progressed into designing and building these types of things, and then I ended up being in charge of building the largest nuclear complex in Canada called the Bruce Nuclear Power Development, which I think you yourself have visited, mm -hmm. and which itself, all by that one power station over there on the Lake Huron, is now providing about 30% of all the electricity that all the viewers are using to run their television sets tonight. So Ontario is a, is a Ontario Hydro has been a, a force for good in the province and we get a lot of our electricity from nuclear power and I'm, I'm very proud of the part, role I've paid. And during that time I guess you had to defend nuclear power quite a bit as well. That was one of the toughest parts. Now, you know, when you mention the word nuclear, you, you push a button in people's heads, and you know, they, they, they just, they just, all they can see is mushroom clouds and glowing in the dark. And uh, you'd think that 
year after year as the nuclear power stations have continued to produce electricity for us here in such a reliable manner that progressively they'd see that these things can be done safely and in, with environmental, with attention to the environment. But, as we all know, there were two massive incidents that occurred in other parts of the world, one in the mm -hmm. United States called Three Mile Island, and the worst one of all in the Soviet Union, which everyone knows. Chernobyl. Everyone? <laughs> Chernobyl. <laughs> Now that really was a disastrous accident. But I should tell you, Peter, that there's not many people have done it, but I have actually, I've been to the Soviet Union, as you probably know, and I actually have been through a Russian nuclear power station. And having built over 15 of them myself, I was in an ideal position to see what they do and compare it with the quality and the engineering that we've tried to build into our plants over the years. And I, and I, I don't know so what was I'm your saying. impression? It was a shock. Because I went to the Soviet Union thinking, here's a country that puts men on the moon, like the United States. Mm -hmm. Here's a country that has the most advanced weapons and fighter planes and radar and everything you can think of. Then why would they build such terrible nuclear power stations? And I walked around them, and they were very poor quality, Peter. Mm -hmm. I was The technology in those Russian power stations dates from the 1950s. It'd be like you driving a 1954 Morris when I drive my 1989 Pontiac. And you put those side by side and you say, what, what's wrong here? I'm in a time warp. And then I slowly began to realize that it was the fact that the system, the very thing Gorbachev is trying to change, in fact, it was the system was keeping the, all the individual people from generating new ideas and introducing them and improving and making it safer. Everybody did everything that was stamped on that drawing in 1954 and nothing has changed since. So you could just see it was a formula for a disaster. Right. And I, I must say it was quite an eye-opener to see why something like that could happen there when I know, and we all know, that it could not happen here. Well, this must develop some opportunities for Canada, for the people who have some expertise now, to maybe help countries like that out. We do a lot of that. And there aren't many people realize their Ontario Hydro, the first thing they think of is, is paying their electricity bill or mm -hmm. electricity that comes through or the poles down the street or the transmission lines across their farms that they don't like. But I have to tell you that... Uh, Another side of Ontario Hydro that not many people are aware of, and I hope that some of your viewers enjoy the, the tape that we show in a few minutes. We have our people all over the world, in India and in Pakistan, in Egypt, in Africa, in Ghana, in Kenya. We have them in, in Korea, in China. And these Ontario Hydro employees are, go over with their experience and their knowledge and their technology, and they work with the people who try to run the electric utility business in that country. They teach them how to run the electric utility. They bring technology that helps them do their job safer. And you come home feeling a lot better because you, you know when that light bulb first comes on in a, in a rural village in Africa, that you've made everybody's life a little better. In fact, you run the division that typically would send the people to these areas. Now, having come from the Bruce Nuclear Power Development as being the project manager there, you then went to becoming the director of the New Business Ventures Division. Why were you selected for that job? It seems to be two opposite ends of the world. Well, it is kind of, I guess. Um, you to get the answer to that question, you'd have to ask the president of Ontario Hydro. But uh, <laughs> the, uh, I guess the simple answer is that uh, I, uh, I've always been something of an entrepreneur myself. Even when I was in charge of building <coughs> the Bruce Nuclear Power Development, I, uh, I was always searching for new ideas, different ways of tackling problems. And uh, my guess is that that was uh, one of the reasons that they decided to give me a shot at this, because it was a brand new thing. I left the job, Peter, in 1984, January, mm -hmm. where I had 8,000 people working for me, and I had an annual budget of $875 million. And the next day, my secretary, Doris, and I started out in an empty floor, just the two of us, with zero dollars and no people, starting from scratch to build something new in hydro and it's been quite a challenge that is a challenge what kind of challenges did you face getting that division going from day one the, the hardest the two biggest challenges that uh, i guess i would identify would be firstly the internal resistance within a corporation the size of ontario hydro to something new i mean hydro is a very big corporation that does many good things for the people of ontario but it is also, being a very large company, is naturally has almost bureaucratic management systems which do not adapt easily to completely new approaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, initially, this new, they, 
most of the employees of this uh, of Hydro looked at this new business ventures thing as as incredulously. They said, you know, this this is not Hydro. This is something new and different. Mm -hmm. But that's why our board of directors decided to do something venturesome like this, to inject new ideas into the corporation. And I think it has achieved that. So that's the one of the <coughs> excuse me one of the biggest challenges. The the other toughest challenge was to convince people that they should do some of these adventurous things around the world. And at first it was tough to say, you know, um, here's a chance for you to work for two years helping the people of Ethiopia. And everybody say, you know, well, why do I want to go to Ethiopia? And then as more and more people started to do it and the word spread that they, it was tough work, but they came back and they, 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 they felt better about doing it and they, uh, their families went with them and they learned something. So the whole experience was, was uh, that many of them reported to us, the whole experience was, was um, a personal fulfillment as well as, as a job that made mm -hmm. good money and a chance to travel. Now when the division was first started, wasn't there a possibility that this may only be a p temporary position for you as well? Well, that I didn't the whole division may only be temporary? Uh, it was a risk. I mean, I, I was told to get the thing going and to be careful that I didn't lose very much money. And the fact is it never did lose any. Uh, year after year, we've just completed our fifth year now, and as you reported at the start, uh, we have grown this business from nothing to $56 million earnings last year, and we paid a net profit back to Ontario Hydro of $10.9 million. Now that's not, you know, $56 million is a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a pretty fair-sized <laughs> company in this province. Compare it with Ontario Hydro, which is a $6 billion company and NBV is about this big. <laughs> Does it make any dent at all in the rates that people pay? We made a profit of, as I said, of 10 million, right. and I think that reduced everybody in Ontario's electricity bill by 86 cents. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good start. Well, it, it's the case of the elephant and the mouse, isn't it? Yeah. I yeah. mean, you have a giant corporation like Hydro, and this is the, the, if you read the Harvard Business Review or some of these texts, you know, they will tell you that this is a constant problem for large corporations that want to start intrapreneurial or venture type activities that they can get buried in the size of the parent mother corporation and you really have to struggle to maintain your independence and not let yourself get overwhelmed by the by the uh, the size and the and the um, systems of the of the owner I'd like to talk to you more about entrepreneurship but before we do that we're going to have to take a short break when we come back we'll be back with Don Anderson the director of new business ventures division at Ontario Hydro video clip showing some of the Hydro's emergency relief efforts in Jamaica after the destruction of Hurricane Gilbert. Can you tell us a little bit about the clip that we're about to see? Well, I, I, I expect your viewers will remember that the, the worst hurricane in the history of, of Jamaica struck that island last fall, and it caused devastating damage. And there was many, many different groups in Toronto were part of the Jamaican Relief Fund collecting food and clothing. And, and Terra Hydro's employees uh, contributed to that. But there was an emergency call. The entire electricity system was flattened. There was no electricity on the island to speak of. Air, all the wires were down, the poles were broke. So um, we, we, we had an emergency call from the Jamaican Electric Utility. And th they called a number of utilities. Some utilities responded by sending a few people to assess the damage. And Terra Hydro chartered these gigantic airplanes that the um, United States Air Force uses to fly whole tanks, and in fact, whole battalions of tanks across to NATO and to, to Europe. I've never seen an airplane so large, Peter, and they, we flew it into the Air Force base here at Trenton. And all those white trucks that everybody sees along the road, the hydro trucks with the arms that do the fixing, we just drove one truck after another onto they this great right big airplane, one after the other, and then these, <laughs> we've never seen anything like this. Anyway, we drove all the trucks on, all the equipment, all the men, piled on this plane, off we went. It cost us 250000 bucks just to lease for one trip this American uh, super, super cargo plane. Flew over to, the, to, the, to Jamaica, and within hours, our crews were spreading out all over the suburbs of Kingston. And the clip shows you some uh, pictures of the equipment being loaded onto the airplane. Mm -hmm. And it will also show you the crews working throughout the damaged areas of the of King of Kingston, Jamaica, and I think they will be horrified when they see the extent of the damage. Well, we'll see. We're going to take a look at that clip right now.
Welcome to Jamaica, land of lush crops like sugarcane, banana, and coffee. Honeymooners and fun in the sun seekers frolic here, enjoying the feel of warm, salty water against sun kissed skin. Beyond the coves and beaches of the Caribbean are painful reminders of the wrath of Hurricane Gilbert. After the storm ended, employees of Jamaica Public Service began the overwhelming task of putting the power back on. The priorities we developed were firstly to try and reach the hospitals, to reach the fire brigade, to reach the water pumps, because these were the areas of greatest need, because you've got to understand that we, after the hurricane, we had no electricity at all. Everything was down. Local crews struggled round the clock, but the extensive damage prompted Siega to put out a call for help. In Canada, Ontario Hydro responded. If anybody told me a week and a half ago I'd be in Jamaica, I'd have told them they were foolish. <laughs> to get the equipment to the scene, Hydro rented the C-5A plane from the United States and loaded it at the Canadian Forces Base in Trenton. This bird has a cargo area of more than 2,300 square feet and can lift over 400,000 pounds into the air. Hydro shipped $1 million worth of equipment to the island during the four-hour flight. Ten hydro crew members and one mechanic flew to Kingston. Most of the men were from Eastern Region's Belleville traveling crew. There was lots of speculation by the men of what Jamaica would be like, but in the end, the decision to help was an easy one to make. Once there, however, the destruction and harsh working conditions stunned the crew. It was no day at the beach. To the surprise of the crew, local residents waited patiently for electricity. Still, they gathered around the site for a closer look at the faces under bright orange and white hats. Life in the town of Portmore would soon be a little easier. Really happy to see you, especially when the lights go back on. That's what they ask you all the time. When's our lights going to be back on? Not the power, the lights. So. Thanks to all the crews working to get the lights back on, Jamaicans are now likely to have a brighter Christmas. You know, I'm sure every one of us are, you know, proud to be here for a when you drive down the streets and they see the Canadian trucks and that, you know, it makes you feel good that they're recognizing you as Canadians. Uh, you know, it makes you proud for that. You know, you kind of swell up and, you know, say, well, I'm a Canadian and we're down here to help. Boy, it looked hot down there. It must have been hard work. Mm, it was. Was it NBV, New Business Ventures Division, that actually got the first call for help? We got the call for help. Um, it was a very expensive program, mm -hmm. and I must say at this point that uh, the most of the f cost of doing that uh, work for Jamaica was paid for by the Canada International Development Agency, CETA. I think Hydro contributed $100,000, but I think the Government of Canada through CETA contributed over 600000 Did Jamaica pay anything for Not this? Not a cent. Not okay. a cent. It was a goodwill gesture on Canada's well, part. Well, when people have had the devastation that... Uh, I don't know how many of your viewers have ever lived through an earthquake or a tornado, but when you see the suffering, you want to do everything you can to help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they seem to be just concerned about getting that light bulb on. Yeah, that's the only thing that they, I mean, once they had light, they figured everything was restored. I mean, here we'd have to have our <laughs> microwave and our ice cube maker and everything else, but all there, all they wanted was to have the lights back. We're spoiled. <laughs> What's it like, Don, running an entrepreneurial division like NBV in a large corporation? It's... Uh, at times difficult, and but more often very rewarding. And the idea of introducing into a, something, a corporation like Ontario Hydro a, a pro separate profit-driven bottom line uh, prerogative, which is what all the private companies have to do, but to introduce that inside a very large company at Hydro, like Hydro, which is as big as government, uh, but isn't government, um, is, is, is difficult. But it has many good side effects. It really does. When you have talked about the division's operating strategy, you have at times made reference to an NBV triangle. Mm -hmm. Can you explain what that is? Well, we had to s make sure that we knew why we were doing this business. If we simply said, we're a part of a terror hydrant, we're out here to make some money, uh, that wouldn't have been good enough. Mm -hmm. So uh, from the start, we said we've got three very clear, very well-defined objectives. Number one is to be profitable. Number two is we're here to, to, to develop uh, stimulating new job opportunities for our employees. 
Everybody likes a change once in a while. You can keep doing the same job year after year, but if once in a while you can go for two years to China and do something good, and then get, you come back to your your old job in hydro feeling, you know, that you've got a different, refreshed, and, and, a, and, a, and a broader perspective. And the third reason, of course, is that Ontario Hydro, as a public utility corporation, is owned by the government, and therefore we have a prerogative to, to do things that will stimulate and develop economic activity within this province. That's, that's How do you do that? That's, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, the, 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 the way we do it is, uh, was the easiest part of this whole exercise that I got into. Um, you know, Terra Hydro has, a, is, 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 has got tremendous technology that is developed for many different applications, Peter. We have our own research center, which is in fact in this, in this uh, on Kipling Avenue, just south of here. And it does many, many advanced new types of technology with robots and lasers, and we use it to support our nuclear power stations and all our electricity business. And we have many, many inventions, and we hold many patents. Well, for years and years, Hydro had all of these great technology ideas, which we used for our own purposes, and then put it on the shelf, or forgot mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. or wrote a report. <laughs> <laughs> well, we came along with our business entrepreneurship, and we said, hey, that technology is a good idea, but they can also use that in the communications industry. Mm -hmm. Or that kind of robot over there, heck, we could take that, and we could license a company here in Ontario to make it, give them the exclusive rights to use it worldwide, and he will be himself a successful business. Now, we've done that over a dozen times now. There are a dozen new companies in this province who got their start by getting the exclusive rights to take a piece of hydro technology. Some of them are very small, simple things. And some are very big and complex things. We give them the exclusive right to manufacture that product. We provide them the support and the engineering to help them solve any, you know, startup problems. And because we're a very large international a marketing company, we do some of the marketing to help them get started in faraway places from South America to Africa. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, I can think of at least four of those companies now are doing over $2 million a year business, and they, own, and they employ five or six people now, and, and, and they're making money. That's a great help. And that's what I mean by stimulating economic activity in Ontario. Use our technology to create jobs in this province. Now, one of your division's major money makers is selling products byproducts such as heavy water. In fact, Hydro, I believe, is the largest uh, producer and seller of heavy, heavy water in the world. Am That's I correct? correct. That's correct. Now, lately, in the news, there have been some talk about a new breakthrough in infusion power. And in mm -hmm. fact, heavy water was one of the major components about that. Are you con excited about that news? Boy, we, for a couple of weeks, I'll tell you, our place was just jumping. When, when the news first broke, it was three weeks ago today that this, these two professors in Utah announced this new discovery called cold fusion. And it astonished the scientific world, Peter, because fusion up till then had, is a new energy form, which my own projection was we would not see used for another 50 to 60 years. So far away it was. And there was all this very expensive research going on to, to, to do it. Then suddenly, two guys in Utah in a test tube duplicate what hundreds of government institutions around the world have been trying for 20 years. How it was your, astonishing. How has your division reacted to this? Well, well, first of all, we've benefited enormously. As you pointed out, I don't know if the viewers are aware of what heavy water is, but I just take a second and explain, you know, when you t return on your tap and get a glass of water, it's water. Mm -hmm. That's H2O. You may not know it, but in that glass of water, about 0.7% is D2O, heavy water. It's there naturally. And what we do in our big refineries at the Bruce is we take that 0.7% out of the ordinary water, and put the rest of the water back in the lake, and we concentrate that 0.7. Very valuable stuff. Well, these experimenters in, in Utah did it with heavy water. Well, Peter, you can't believe it. Uh, the fellows that on, the, on the part of our business that handle these isotopes, the phone started to jump off the hooks. We were getting mm -hmm. calls from Rome. We were getting calls from the southern United States, from Texas. They were all calling in at once. And we sold $400,000 worth of heavy water in two and a half weeks. <laughs> plus about half again as much deuterium gas, which is another commodity. Every university in the world wanted to mm -hmm. have this stuff instantly, and everybody knew that right here, Ontario Hydro had the best and highest quality and the, most, the best product for sale. So <laughs> in one way, we benefit. The real question is, is this for real, or is it kind of a, a funny, funny happening and a news hoax? Mm -hmm. And the jury's, the jury's still out for me, Peter. I'm, I hate to say it, because I really thought at first these guys had something. But you know, there are over 250 
different institutions around the world experimenting, trying to duplicate that right now. There's a hundred of them in the United States. There's yeah. 30 here in Canada. So jury's still out. Nobody's been able to duplicate it. Ontario Hydro is such a large corporation. Over 25,000 employees. How does somebody stand out? How do they advance to the fast track to climb the, the ladder of such an organization? Well, Peter, it's, it's tough in a large company like that to, to stand out. The, the, the two best pieces of advice I can give in, for people that want to, want to work in a large corporation as opposed to a small private business is first and foremost, be yourself. And secondly, don't be overly ambitious. Let it come naturally. Now, that, that may sound like strange advice, but when, when, when I hire a lot of people, and, and when they come in with their ambitions so hanging out on their shoulder and with so much intensity of, of their career path all tracked out for the next 10 years, I'm turned off. Mm -hmm. I want somebody that's coming in, likes the, job, likes the job for the sound of it, wants to do the best job he can. And that's the way you make it anywhere in this world. I'm sure lots of people would like to work for you, Don. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today on Careers. We're out of time. All right, Peter. It's nice being here. I'm Peter Wolfel, and from all of us here at the studio, good luck in your own career.